Hello and welcome to part four of our online lesson evaluating monetary policy. In an earlier lesson we described quantitative easing as an unconventional measure of monetary policy that was used by a number of central banks including the European Central Bank, Federal Reserve in the United States, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England. Pause the video now and see if you can think of a couple of reasons as to why these unconventional measures were used in the wake of the global financial crisis. So we know it was used after the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. And we also know that central banks around the world had cut interest rates their lowest ever levels, near 0%. Okay, so the main firing mechanism, if you will, the change in interest rates to manipulate monetary policy, hadn't really worked. And therefore, central banks needed another lever in order to stimulate economies because the interest rate transmission mechanism wasn't working as effectively as it could. In other words, changes in aggregate demand weren't being influenced by changes in interest rates. And interest rates couldn't easily be cut any further than what they had already been. So let's have a look in a bit more detail as to what these unconventional measures of monetary policy are. We know that there are alternatives to changing the interest rate. In a previous lesson, we looked at quantitative easing which is a purchase of government bonds from financial institutions by the central bank. Another measure is that of forward guidance. And this is where the central bank is clear about future monetary policy and the conditions in which it might change. So, forward guidance is essentially trying to convert short-term interest rates into longer-term interest rates. The governor of the central bank makes it clear as to what direction monetary policy might take in the future. So, one of the things that Mark Carney did when he was governor of the Bank of England, he said that he would look at changing interest rates when the conditions of the output gap or the size of the output gap changed. In other words, what he was doing here, he was trying to offer some further guidance in the future as to when interest rates might change, thereby helping various economic actors plan investment decisions in the case of business, for example. Another aspect of unconventional monetary policy is negative interest rates. And this makes it expensive for commercial banks to hold reserves at the central bank, making it more likely they will lend instead. Credit easing involves measures to improve liquidity, buying corporate bonds in order to further increase liquidity in the banking sector. And finally, qualitative easing involves a central bank selling high quality assets and buying low quality more toxic assets. Now, let's have a little look at a thinking skills task where we're going to assess these unconventional measures of monetary policy. For each measure on your screen, see if you can identify a strength and a weakness. You will then be able to use this knowledge and understanding in a question on monetary policy that you encounter in the future. So pause now. Now, let's see how you got on when you were addressing those three different areas of monetary policy and trying to pick out the strengths and weaknesses. Let's start off with quantitative easing. Strengths. We know it can work quite quickly. The central bank can effectively create new money at the stroke of a computer key and it can use that new money to buy bonds. When it buys those bonds, it effectively increases the liquidity of financial institutions. When financial institutions have got more liquidity, this means that there is more money that's available for lending by consumers and by businesses. QE can also help remove toxic assets from the financial system. A toxic asset is an asset for which there's no longer a market. Why is there no longer a market for it? Well, it's because the value of that asset has fallen significantly. If you want to draw upon an example of what a toxic asset is, think of the more market for mortgage-backed securities that featured so prominently in the global financial crisis. Some of the downsides of QE effectively involve low interest rates. Now, low interest rates are bad for those that rely on savings. Furthermore, QE causes a rise in asset prices. One of these assets that is known to rise in price as a result of QE being introduced is house prices. When house prices increase, this increases wealth inequality. Added to wealth inequality is also the issue of intergenerational inequality. This is when the, the elderly benefit more, more likely at the expense of those who are younger. 
if you're young, you're probably going to be unlikely to be on the housing market, whereas those who are elderly will have probably already have a house. And therefore, as that asset increases in price, they gain. The strengths of forward guidance. Firstly, forward guidance boosts business confidence. Why does it do that? Because the monetary authorities essentially lay out a timetable as to how monetary policy is going to change over the next three, six or nine months. And therefore, businesses can plan their investment and that adds to their confidence. Furthermore, this transparency in monetary policy improves market efficiency. Some weaknesses of forward guidance. If a central bank is clear as to the direction that monetary policy is going to take, it actually reduces its ability to respond to, to new economic shocks. Furthermore, it might actually imply quite a bleak economic outlook. Finally, let's look at negative interest rates. Negative interest rates essentially make it costly for commercial banks to lodge money at the central bank. Now, one of the strengths of using a policy of negative interest rates is it has a strong effect on currency depreciation. Negative interest rates further weaken the exchange rate. In other words, it has a strong effect on currency depreciation because it causes exports to become cheaper. This benefits those businesses that export and are reliant upon exports for generating sales revenue. For those countries that rely upon exports as a high percentage of aggregate demand, they are going to benefit. Furthermore, negative interest rates help borrowers. Borrowers are typically going to be worse off after economic shocks, as they are going to be more reliant on credit. Finally, the weaknesses of negative interest rates. Negative interest rates reduce bank incentives to maintain strong buffers. A buffer is the amount of capital that a bank has to keep in reserve. In other words, it's the amount of money they have to have that they need to be able to draw upon in case they make a loss. And finally, the policy of negative interest rates is so unconventional that it might actually reduce confidence throughout the entire economy and could have negative impacts.